this film is about atomic power, so please don't switch off. This time it does concern you directly. Let me start with three facts. Number one, anyone with an expert knowledge of physics can make an atomic bomb with just that much of a substance called plutonium. Number two, a speck of plutonium causes cancer. Number three, there is no absolutely safe way of storing, protecting, or transporting plutonium. And you may have read recently that enough plutonium to make 15 atomic bombs has officially disappeared from nuclear research centers in Britain, like the one across the water here at Windscale in Cumbria. And yet plutonium is what you're going to get if the government go ahead and build the first commercial nuclear power station fueled by plutonium. The first of many so-called fast breeder reactors that will solve all our energy problems, according to the salesmen of our nuclear industry, but not according to an independent royal commission. The head of the royal commission, Sir Brian Flowers, said, we believe that nobody should rely on an energy process as dangerous as plutonium unless he is absolutely convinced that there is no reasonable alternative course of action. I am bound to say that we have not been convinced that this is the case by the evidence submitted to us. This is a complex subject for a documentary, but we on the outside must at least try to understand the great risks we are being asked to take. That's why most of this report was filmed in Japan, where the world's first human nuclear guinea pigs live. People whose experiences and suffering might help us to understand. Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. The atomic age had been inaugurated with a human sacrifice of 210,000 persons. Thousands more were crippled and maimed, threatening with hideous congenital deformities, generations yet unborn. But what was an unqualified success for science was an unmitigated disaster for humanity. If we go ahead with plutonium fast breeder reactors. What do you see happening in the next few years? I share the opinion of many senior weapons experts around the world that the odds are in favor of there being a nuclear war, a global nuclear war, in my lifetime. And if there is, I think one of the major contributing factors to that will have been the distribution of civil nuclear technology in the last 20 years. I think the issue that we've got to concern ourselves with is, is what we're doing today safe? Uh, and I believe it is. Are the uh, proposals for the construction of the next round of nuclear power stations responsible and proper? And I believe they are. Um, are things going to be all right in the future if we continue to improve our technology and watch the difficulties, as we're doing at the present time. And I believe that, yes, it will be. I can see a, a bigger nuclear industry by the end of the century and a very responsible and safe nuclear industry by the end of the 70s. We have to recognize that there is no borderline between civil nuclear technology and military nuclear technology. The one shades imperceptibly into the other. And if we are, for example, in Britain, going to become suppliers of plutonium to the world, which is the kind of proposal that BNFL have in mind for Windscale, then I think we bear a terrible responsibility. And it is not one that I personally want to accept. 
every morning in this park in Hiroshima, this clock strikes a quarter past eight, the exact time the atomic age burst upon the Japanese. At a quarter past eight on the 6th of August, 1945, an American B-29 released the atomic bomb directly above here. There was a blue flash, described by one survivor as like a huge electric fault, and this was followed by wind like a tornado and black rain and a firestorm and 200,000 people died, many of them slowly. And they are still dying. In the last 12 months alone, 1,600 people died from injuries and diseases directly connected with that one explosion. The whole city was on fire. Their faces were so badly burnt, it was impossible to tell whether they were men or women. Even if they were people of this world at all. I couldn't believe they were still alive. The underground shelters were full of dying people. There was no light, not even a candle. A woman cried, help me, I'm having a baby. Someone said, I'm a midwife, I will help you. People forgot their pain and tried to help with the birth. The midwife died in the night, covered in blood. I don't know what happened to the baby. I noticed my face was swelling, getting so big I couldn't see, and my hands swelling like balloons. I, I couldn't grasp anything, couldn't reach the children. But I saw their eyes move and knew they were alive. People were crying for water. I gave them some and, and drank some myself. My wife called out for water and I saw she had these holes in her head, big enough for two fingers. They were using the temples as hospitals. There were very few doctors. My whole body was covered in pus flies and maggots crawling over me. We were lying on these rush mats, and when the women came to bathe the wounds, they lifted me from the mat. My back was stuck to it. They had to tear it off. I've never known such agony. The people in the factory were nearly all dead. We looked for survivors, dragging them from the wreckage, but their skin was so badly burned, it was actually melting. The limbs came away in our hands. They were beyond help. We took the bodies, covered them in oil, and burned them. The stench was unbelievable. Mr. Tanakuchi, you brought along a photograph which you said you wanted to, to show us. I had to lie on my stomach, like this, in the picture, for a year and nine months. It took a long time to get any proper treatment. A long time. I was in such agony, I did not believe I could live. On two occasions, I stopped breathing altogether. I should like to read another description of a nuclear explosion. People die by the tens of thousands. The devastation and contamination are on an unbelievable scale. The immediate danger zone stretches six miles downwind from the explosion, and there is an even more horrifying toll of human life in an area extending as far as 120 miles downwind. Over several decades, tens of thousands of people die from cancer. 
These words are condensed from a report issued in Britain just nine months ago by the Health and Safety Executive at the request of the Energy Secretary, Mr. Tony Benn. It is an official forecast of what would happen following an accidental explosion at a plutonium-fueled nuclear reactor in heavily populated Britain. The kind of reactor the government will shortly decide whether or not to build for you. First of all, what is the probability of the accident happening? And it is so remote. It is of a lower probability than uh, bigger natural causes, earthquakes, dams... We're having earthquakes all the time now. We could have a, a nuclear accident tomorrow, surely. Yes, you could have a nuclear accident, but what is the probability of having it? The nuclear industry claim that the possibility of an explosion is remote. Last November, the Soviet scientist, Dr. Zoris Medvedev, published evidence of an explosion at a nuclear dump in Russia, which killed hundreds and turned a region as big as an English county into a contaminated wilderness. Villages there are now deserted, crops and cattle gone, the water undrinkable. At wind scale, there has been at least one near disaster. At Detroit, alarm bells rang at a fast breeder reactor, but experts could not investigate without triggering an explosion. Two years ago, one of them said, we almost lost Detroit. If there's so many questions unanswered and, and mm. the nuclear industry agree that there are, why are we rushing into it? Why don't we have another four or five years of, of study? It's a very good question. I think I have finally come full circle to realize. Uh, you probably know that people like me regularly are accused by the nuclear industry of being very emotional about their arguments. But recently it's become clear to me that the nuclear industry itself has a deep emotional commitment to its technology. In fact, it's so deep that the industry tends to ignore basic economic arguments. And Why is I that? think this may be because an awful lot of people working in the industry are still acutely conscious of the reason why nuclear technology was originally developed for nuclear weapons. And they are deeply committed to try and demonstrate that basically nuclear energy is beneficial to mankind. I'm no longer convinced that this is the case. I don't think they are going to be able to prove that. And I'm very much afraid in, that in the effort to prove it, they may bring the catastrophe down on us. The campaign to sell us nuclear power comes from a long line of nuclear salesmanship. The atomic bomb was sold to us as the means that ended World War II. And yet its other purpose was research, to find out what would happen if a Russian bomb was dropped on America. In 1954, the Atoms for Peace program was sold to us as the means of spreading the benefits of the so-called peaceful atom. The more important responsibility of this atomic energy agency would be to devise methods whereby this fission material would be allocated to serve the peaceful pursuits of mankind. The real purpose of Atoms for Peace was to establish American domination over the world nuclear market. The International Atomic Energy Agency was to lay down safeguards. But in 1975, less than six million dollars of the agency's budget was for safeguards, and 30 million dollars were for the promotion of American-made reactors. In the meantime, bigger and bigger bombs were tested at a furious rate in Russia and in the Nevada desert. These, of course, were peaceful explosions. The salesmanship reached its peak in 1963 with the Test Ban Treaty. Of course, this did not interfere with nuclear testing or with free enterprise. In 1973, President Nixon finally lifted the veil when he ruled that private American companies could trade directly in nuclear merchandise. Today, we are once again being sold the atom Reconditioned, low mileage, new price tag, new name, plutonium. Like the used car salesman, the nuclear salesman never gives up. This year, as last year, the world's most secretive organization met at the Foreign Office in Whitehall. It's called the London Suppliers Group, although its 15 members prefer the more exclusive title of the London Club. The members are all from the developed world, Europe, America, Japan, and each is a supplier, or rather an old-fashioned salesman with a rare product 
in an expanding, highly competitive, and very rich market. The product is nuclear power, from which nuclear weapons can be made. And due largely to their salesmanship, the following countries, including countries on the edge of war, already have the atomic bomb, or will have the means to build it by 1980. Argentina, Austria, Belgium, Brazil, Canada, China, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Egypt, Finland, France, Hungary, India, Iran, Israel, Italy, Japan, Mexico, Netherlands, Norway, Pakistan, Philippines, Poland, South Africa, South Korea, Soviet Union, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, Taiwan, Thailand, United Kingdom, United States, West Germany, Yugoslavia, Zaire. That's 36 countries in all. A most successful export drive since the product was first tested here in Hiroshima. You are seeing Hiroshima not to trick your emotions, but because Hiroshima is still the largest source of information about the effects of radiation. This is the atomic bomb hospital. Last August, a symposium was told of the extremely high incidence of leukemia among victims exposed to low levels of radiation. This could mean that the former guidelines from Hiroshima are wrong. It could also mean that the acceptable levels of radiation around nuclear plants in Britain, like wind scale, are already too high. Well, the first effects of the bomb were burns and injuries but the long-term effects are from radiation. These go on forever. The danger with radiation is that it can't be seen or felt even when you're exposed to it. So without knowing it, you become sicker and sicker. It's very terrifying. So as far as you're concerned, you're quite satisfied that the effects of radiation are passed from one generation to another? Yes but we don't know the full effects. We cannot know the full effects on future generations for perhaps another hundred years. Certainly, if there was a serious nuclear accident, then there'd be a release of radioactivity. But the question is, how important is it? Would it do anybody any harm? Is it comparable with the radioactivity in the Earth, in the atmosphere, all around us? Man has lived with radioactivity since evolution began. People in Ravenglass near Windscale are today living with Dalek-like machines in their front gardens. The machine's purpose is to monitor the level of radiation in their atmosphere. Last week, Professor Wendell Potts of Lancaster University told the Windscale Inquiry that if the nuclear industry continued to release radioactive isotopes into the Irish Sea, whole areas of the sea would have to be closed to fishermen. He said the fish caught in the Irish Sea now contained enough radiation to cause significant genetic damage to the general population. Radiation is only one danger. Sir Brian Flowers has said, Plutonium offers a unique and powerful weapon to those who are sufficiently determined to impose their will. In these circumstances, I do not believe it is a question of whether someone will deliberately acquire it for purposes of terrorism or blackmail, but only of when and how often. Even the Japanese are being asked to forget their past and to embrace nuclear power. The energy panic has produced a free-for-all export market in which, believes Sir John Hill, Britain must take a vigorous part. There's big money involved. And already, Britain's first major nuclear deal has been worked out with Japan. The deal is to reprocess 4,000 tons of Japanese nuclear waste at wind scale. But the problem is, how do we get it back to Japan? Last June, the managing director of British Nuclear Fuels admitted that this huge dump of highly radioactive waste could remain in Britain indefinitely. By the late 1980s, 
energy is going to be short and it's going to be very expensive. And where is this energy coming from if it isn't going to come from oil and gas? And so what I would say is, yes, of course, plutonium is a nasty material. There's no question about that. But frankly, I don't believe there is any alternative. And I think that is the view of most responsible bodies that have studied the world energy situation. It is certainly not the view of a House of Commons Select Committee, which last Wednesday accused the Department of Energy of complacency and timidity in its approach to alternate sources of energy. For example, in tidal power, Britain's enormous energy potential is acknowledged, but the government has been reluctant to evaluate it. Solar power has the greatest immediate potential, and Britain leads the world in research into wave power. And yet these renewable, harmless energy sources account for just 1% of the energy development budget. Why? Anyone who tells you that there is going to be such a desperate panic that the only thing we can do is to go for nuclear electricity, fast breeders and plutonium is trying to stampede you so that you don't stop and think. And I would hope we aren't going to be stampeded by special interests. I asked Mr. Kikawa how he felt when he saw all the developments in nuclear power and nuclear weapons in the world today. There is now the problem of plutonium. These developments are very dangerous and we're afraid of this dependence on nuclear energy. We know the dangers better than anyone else in the world. And all the survivors are getting old. Soon there will be no one left to tell what really happened. I think it is a very dangerous situation and can so easily get out of hand, even in your country, in so-called democracies. People must realize they are all possible victims, that it is their problem, not just a problem for the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. People talk about acceptable levels of radiation. I have received more than the acceptable level. There is no acceptable level of radiation. They are playing with words when they say nuclear power for peaceful purposes. Peaceful sounds reassuring. They say peaceful because they know all about the dangers involved. There will be some scientists and politicians who will say that this film is emotional. But unlike them, almost all the witnesses in the film actually took part in the first nuclear experiment using human beings here in Hiroshima. Please be clear about one thing. Those who want the British government to build the nation's first commercial scale nuclear power station, fueled by plutonium, want you and your children to take part in an experiment. In other words, in order to save an industry that has been many times proven uneconomic, inefficient, and dangerous, they want you to take a risk. Do you really want a future of nuclear installations that are not completely safe, of waste dumps radioactive for thousands of years, of atomic policemen ruthlessly guarding these poisons? And do you want to spend hundreds of millions of pounds on this unjustifiable risk, when just a fraction of that amount could make our coal mines safer and more productive and develop other sources of energy of which Britain has an abundance. And are we that hard up that Britain now needs to export to other countries the means of making the atomic bomb? These questions have to be answered by you and not by nuclear salesmen in jargon which only they can understand. Sometime this autumn, the government will decide whether or not to commit you to a fast breeder plutonium reactor and perhaps to a new atomic age. But as politicians, they know that this is what's called a sensitive public issue and you are the public. Isn't it up to you to speak out now? before the next Hiroshima's.
Since this report was filmed, the government has postponed its decision on fast breeder reactors pending further public inquiry.